So what we would like to do in these two and a half days is to focus more on the type of statistical methods which we would need specifically when working with quantitative mass spectrometry and proteomics. Uh, those of you who were not here last week, we spent the first two and a half days talking about how we can process raw data using uh, platforms such as OpenMS or Skyline, and we can come to the point where we have a list of identified and quantified peaks. Uh, then also last week, we spent some time working with either uh, R at the beginner's level or R at the intermediate and advanced level. And we also spent quite some time talking about basic statistical methods, such as foundations of experimental design, uh, statistical inference, and uh, kind of talking about things such as p-values and what they are and how good they are and how bad they are. However, everything we did uh, talked about the statistical methods. We didn't really do much specific to type of data that we produce in quantitative mass spectrometry experiments. So the goal of this two and a half days to really be a lot more specific to mass spectrometry. However, because we have kind of a mixed group, some of you were in this classroom last week, some of you were not, I will do a little bit of revision just of two things which are uh, quite important for us. So let me first um, start about saying why statistics, start saying about why statistics are really important and why we need to spend so much time actually talking about these issues in the main institute. So the fact is that in the quantitative experiments, mass spectrometry based or otherwise, uh, variation and uncertainty are unavoidable. And so we have different sources of variation. We have technical variation, which comes from things such as how we sample, uh, how we collect the samples, handle, store them, process them. We have instrumental variation, so things such as matrix effects, ion suppression, signal overlap, uh, interferences, and so on, they all affect the quantitative values which we have as output um, of the experiments. Signal processing, so last week we talked quite a bit about the fact that different decisions that tools such as OpenMS and Skyline make can affect the abundances, or the, at least the areas under the peaks, chromatographic peaks, which will affect downstream conclusions. But all of that is fairly minor compared to the real important source of variation, which is a biological variation. So even we can, if we can improve our workflows to perfection, the biological variation is really the most important part that we want to study. And it's also something that we cannot eliminate by any kind of type of optimization of experiments. And therefore, our goal is to distinguish the systematic biological variation, which is induced by I don't know, treatments, stresses, diseases, whatever we want to study, from the random variation, which is just natural day-to-day -day variation in the biological systems, and also technological variation, which for the moment is unavoidable in these experiments. And so the overall goal, and this is really the main focus of this week for us, is how to establish good statistical practice and good data analysis practice, which ensures reproducible research. Because the ultimate goal of statistical analysis is not do it because, you know, statisticians tell you so, right? Or because NIH tells you so or somebody else. But because we really want to make sure that our results are reproducible, but also effective, right? So if there is a signal in the biological system, we want to make sure that we design the experiment and analyze the data in a way that we can actually uncover this signal. And so reproducibility, and we talked about this last week, but just as a review, um, is that it's actually not a thing, it's a spectrum. And so on one side of the spectrum, we have results which are not repeatable and publication only. And this unfortunately happens, and we don't want that, right? So we really want to make sure that our results can be repeated and reproduced. And so the spectrum here varies from repeatable data analysis, where we have the same data and an analysis which is, let's say, published or somehow documented. And we want to make sure that we take this data, we take the workflow, and we can repeat step by step everything to generate the same figures, the same numbers. And that by itself is quite challenging, especially with tools such as Excel or other tools such as Skyline or others which have a lot of human intervention, a lot of point-and-click 
that by itself is challenging. And I can even say from our own experience, if the data analysis workflow is not entirely automated, it is very difficult to even take the same input data and get the same figure, the same summary. So the goal of our discussions here is to really try to move as close as possible towards uh, repeatable data analysis. But we want more than that because some of the decisions that we make as part of data analysis are really secondary. They are necessary, but they are not critical. So something such as how many points we use to integrate a chromatographic peak. So if we use 10 points versus 9 points, we will not get the same number, but hopefully it will not have a dramatic effect on our qualitative conclusions. And many other uh, things that we use as part of uh, statistical analysis, some of these decisions are necessary, but we hope that our results are not determined completely by these decisions. And so reproducible data analysis would mean that if we use methods which are intended for the same purpose and perform roughly similarly, we really want to make sure that these different alternative methods have produced qualitatively similar results. We do not expect the same numbers because they're different methods, but we expect the same biological conclusions. So in this case, our results do not depend on the li little tiny choices that we make, but they really re reflect the actual biology. But this is not enough because this is still the same biological samples and the same experiment. So further in the spectrum is the experiment that is repeatable. So if I have the same biological material, can I acquire the data once again, reanalyze the data once again, and obtain qualitatively the same results? But the gold standard of reproducibility is actually reproducing the entire experiment. So take new biological material, new individuals in the study, acquire the data, analyze the data, and have the same conclusions. And so really all the previous steps are required to make sure that we have the gold standard. And so I would like to argue that statistical mindset actually contributes along the entire spectrum. So in terms of repeatable data analysis, we want to have software which kind of not only automates, but also documents everything that we do step by step. Reproducible data analysis means that we know which are the methods which are designed for roughly the same purpose and which methods are not designed for the same purpose. We understand the advantages and disadvantages, and many times there is more than one method which can do a good job with this type of data. So we want to make sure that we know what these methods are, we use them appropriately, and in this case, we will have results which are mutually consistent. And then repeated ex repeatable experiment and reproducible experiment, this is more on the experimental design uh, side. So how we allocate the resources in the way which minimize the bias, minimize the undue variation, so that our results reflect the biology and not the experimental artifacts. And so things such as replication, randomization, blocking that we discussed last week are really important for us. So, this is extremely important, not just in general statistics, but also for the type of experiments that we discuss here. So this was a, one part of this discussion. And again, I'm just doing this very briefly, but all the videos from the lectures are online. So if you feel like you would like to kind of see more of what we did, you could not join us last week, I'll make sure you do that. So this is one. And so another, so two more uh, things that I would like to review from last week as well, because this is really important for us to understand the data and understand the questions we will be working with. So one is talking about the goals of statistical analysis, and the other is an example of why in mass spectrometry, in particular, these goals sometimes can be difficult to achieve. So let me very briefly review the goals of statistical analysis, and this is kind of important for us for this two and a half days. So briefly, or kind of in a very kind of broad way, we can partition or distinguish three types of statistical goals. So all of them have something to do with patterns or classes. So classes are essentially either proteins or subjects which have something in common. And so the first statistical goal is class discovery. And this would be based on something like heat maps that you have all seen a lot, I'm sure. So here the rows will be proteins. And the columns will be samples. And the color will be the abundance of a protein in a sample. And let's say you have some kind of way to summarize multiple spectral features. So we just have one number per protein per sample. And so then the goal of class discovery would essentially be to find some patterns of similarity. For example, we want to find proteins which behave in a similar way in the space of subjects. 
And this is useful because maybe these biological samples, maybe they are time course of some sort. And if the proteins behave similarly across the time course, maybe they're involved in the same biological process, such as, I don't know, infection, right? Or maybe some kind of uh, treatment. On the other hand, we may also want to look at subjects which have similar profiles in the space of uh, proteins. And let's say we have uh, cancer samples, and now we want to look for subjects which have similar molecular profiles. Maybe these are cancer subtypes. So this is also quite useful to us. The important thing is that these methods have no information about what we're looking for. We just say, let's define what we mean by samples being similar or proteins being similar, and let's look for groups of similar things. So these things can be similar for good reasons, because it's real biology or real disease, but they can also be similar for bad reasons, such as batch effects or biases or some type of artifacts. And these methods will not be able to take this apart. They will not be able to distinguish that. And so you would see things such as principal component analysis. So here, each axis is some linear combination of all the proteins in the study. Each point is a biological sample. We say things such as if they are close together, it means that the samples form a similar group. But maybe this is a similar group because all of the samples were acquired on one day and other samples were acquired on the other day. And so sometimes I hear things such as, oh, we have samples which cluster on the principal component analysis plot. Therefore, we found biomarkers of disease. These are not biomarkers of disease, right? Because this method has no idea of what we mean by disease. Who has the disease, who doesn't have. This method does not take this information as input. So these methods are good for data visualization. In fact, folks next door will spend a lot of time on things like that, talking about uh, how to visualize the data in this higher dimensional space, how to extract some information from that. So for our purposes here, we just need to know that these are not the methods which would take into account the information that we have about what is a disease and what is not a disease. So it is useful for quality control, useful for data visualization, useful to find some patterns which may be of interest, but they're not necessarily useful patterns to us because we don't know that. So the second goal is class comparison. So unlike the previous method, which is unsupervised, where we don't give the information about what we mean by a class, this is actually a supervised method. So we are giving to the method the information. These are the subjects. Let's say they're healthy. And these are the subjects who are diseased. So now we add this annotation to each biological sample. And so the goal for us would be to compare the average protein abundance, let's say, among the healthy group to the average protein abundance in the disease group. And the methods that we would use would be t-test, analysis of variants, permutation tests, you know, some Bayesian methods, and the type of output would be p-values, posterior probabilities, and so on. So this is very frequently used in our field, and we talked about this extensively um, last week, the very important feature of this type of methods is that they compare the averages of protein abundance. So we want to know if, the, so if these individual dots are individual, let's say, healthy people, the red dots are the individual disease people, the y-axis is the abundance of a particular protein in each of these two groups. We want to know if this mean abundance of the protein in this group is systematically different from the mean protein abundance uh, in the healthy from the disease. And if there is a change, it means that the protein was upregulated, meaning that it's somehow involved in the process of the disease. So if it's upstream of the disease or downstream, we don't know, but at least it somehow is affected by this particular process. And again, those of you who are just joining us, I'm talking about the differences as opposed to ratios, because Everything we will do this week, we actually talk about feature intensities on the log scale. So everything we'll do, we'll first take a log, right? And log of a ratio is a difference of the logs. And so if we talk about differences, you can think of this as a log ratio. And if for some reasons you would want to communicate the results to your colleagues on the original scale, we just need to undo the log, right? And the results will be the same. So there's really no contradiction, but in terms of statistical properties, it is much easier to work with differences and you know, additive and things than ratios. So this is quite useful. And as a matter of fact, for, for 
at least today, we will really focus on this type of problem. So we will focus on the second goal, which is class comparison. What it is not useful for is for things such as discovery of biomarkers of disease. So this is also something I get to review a lot of papers where people say, we found proteins with small p-values, therefore we found biomarkers. And this is again not true. And the reason for this is that here, the goal is to compare averages in the entire populations. But a biomarker is supposed to be something actionable for a doctor. And doctor is not seeing an average patient. The doctor sees this particular patient. And so a biomarker is supposed to be actionable and would allow us to make decisions for a single person as opposed to the average. And so even if on average a, there is a difference, it may not necessarily be a difference which would allow us to make decisions for an individual person. For example, in this case, we can probably say that there is a systematic difference in means between the two groups. However, if a person comes in with this value of protein abundance, it can be healthy, it can be disease. So if, or for example, this value of abundance, right? So even if on average there is a shift, an individual value may not allow us to discriminate between the groups. And so usually these type of methods are useful for basic biology. Clearly when we work with model organisms, like let's say we work with yeast samples, all we want to know is up and down, right? So this will be quite useful. It can also be useful in early stages of biomarker discovery. For example, when we work with discovery experiments and we want to narrow down a large list of analytes to a smaller number for targeted follow-up. So this can definitely be a useful screening step. However, this is not a final step which can allow us to claim predictive ability. So what we need to do in that case, if we really are interested in discovery of biomarkers, is yet another supervised, the class of supervised methods. So this is a different statistical goal, which is class prediction. So unlike goal number two, which compares averages, here we need to make decisions for individual subjects in the study. And so, for example, if we have two proteins, so this is protein one and protein two, each point is a person, let's say blue is healthy and red is disease. So we can have a predictive rule which essentially ignores protein 1 and just uses a cutoff for protein 2 and says high values of protein 2 will be healthy, low values will be disease. And it kind of works, but we also see that some of the red dots are misclassified as healthy because there is a lot of variation in protein 2. So what we can also do now is to have a different approach where we use both protein 1 and 2 and have a more complicated decision rule which involves both proteins. So now we see that we do not misclassify as many red points, but we misclassify some. Or we can have a very, very complicated decision rule which now does not misclassify any of the data points in our study. But chances are that this accommodates too much some random artifacts or some variability which is not really systematic variability due to the disease. So this is likely too close to the individual points. This is likely too simple. So maybe this is a little bit more complex but not too complex. So these methods will be looking for this type of decision boundaries to use as few proteins as possible and as simple rules as possible but to provide a good discrimination between health and disease. And so methods that you would use for this is logistic regression, um, classification trees, random forest, support vector machine, deep learning, and all kind of things like that. And the readouts they will provide will be very different. So this will be not p-values, it will be things such as sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and so on. And typically these methods require a fairly large sample size. They require a separate validation set, which we would use to see how these rules that we learn on some sets of data perform on new sets of data and so on. So usually this requires quite a lot more work and we will actually get to these methods at the end of the two and a half days. So for today I will actually focus on statistical goal number two which is I would say probably among the most frequent goals in many uh, studies. So before I move on do you have any questions? Because I can speak very fast and a lot so yes. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so, and there are several things, right? So on one hand, you need to decide what are the analytes, which are even candidates, right, for you to consider, right? 
and on the other hand is the biological samples on which you would need to see how they perform, right? So usually the methods like this, I would say require less number of biological replicates than methods like this, because it would probably take kind of less information to be very, very confident in averages as opposed to kind of be able to characterize each individual subject. So usually this is actually not a single step approach, but it's an iterative approach. So first you may want to start with some global screening experiments, which would look for potential candidates of interest. And you can think of these global experiments as a hypothesis generation step. But you can also generate, generate your hypothesis from other places, right, including the literature, including your previous studies, you know, and so on. And so then as you go, you would narrow down more and more the number of analytes while changing the methods towards more class prediction methods. So having few, fewer analytes and larger sample size. And what we will actually emphasize at the end of the two and a half days that the number of biological replicates which is needed for this type of things is a lot more than what many people think. So you really not need a fairly large sample size. And actually, if you are staying for the end of this week, there will be quite a bit of discussion with Rudy Abersold and Mike McCoss about the technological advances of how to also make increases throughput in terms of both analytes and samples. So we will kind of back to the technology of that at the end of the week. But essentially, you would need to have enough data to find the analytes, then to find this type of discriminative rules. And then you would need to have a separate set of biological replicates to apply these rules on new data and show, OK, this is my sensitivity, this is my specificity, and so on. So it is actually a fairly long process. And we will give you some examples of that. Our group has been involved in this type of study, so we will show you a little bit of that. Other questions? Well, please feel free to interrupt me. Even though I speak fast, don't hesitate. So second thing that I will also review from last week, but it is important for us also in part because I need to introduce a data set that you will use for quite some time for as part of hands-on um, uh, work uh, these two and a half days. So let me go straight uh, to this. So I was involved in the organization called Association of Biomedical Resource Facilities. So this is essentially an organization which brings together people who work in core facilities and their goal is not necessarily to develop new cutting edge methods, but rather make sure that the existing methods perform at their best so that they can provide reliable results to their collaborators. And so what they do for that is they essentially have a series of studies where they share either biological samples or data sets, and then they go and they use their current established practice to analyze the data, and then they compare results. And they, So it's not a competition. It's more like, OK, what works best, how we can improve our workflows. And so uh, myself and my group members were involved in a one such study which focused specifically on statistical analysis of label-free LCMS. So we wanted to know specifically the data analysis side, how reproducible and how accurate the results were from various members of this community. And so to do that, we need to work in a situation where we know the answer, because it's really hard to compare the results if you don't know the ground truth. And so therefore, we created a synthetic mixture. And statisticians love controlled mixtures, because we always, you know, the thing in statistics is no matter what you do, you always have some numbers back, right? And so you want to know, well, are my numbers better than your numbers, right? So you need to have some framework where you can evaluate different type of methods. And so in this particular case, we created a, a synthetic mixture which had a complex yeast background. And we spiked different proteins into this background. And so uh, four proteins had this systematic pattern. It's called a Latin square design, where each protein is present in each concentration once. And in each sample, we have each protein in different concentration. And then we had this additional protein spiked as well. So uh, the organizers created this mixture and collected data on a thermal instrument in a DDA um, profile mode. And we made available to the participants either the raw data. We also did database search and identified 
the peptides in this mixture. Now, for these proteins, we created fake yeast IDs so that the participants don't know which spike proteins were actually from a different organism. So we just um, made some yeast-looking uh, protein names. And we also used Skyline to find MS1 peaks and integrate and identify and quantify peaks. So the participants could start from any of the three points. They could just start from raw data and do everything on their own. They could use the identified spectra but not quantified spectra, or they can use identified and quantified peaks and focus entirely on the statistical analysis. So these were three different options. And so this is the result of the submission. So they're all de-identified, so we don't know who is who. Um, here at the x-axis is the identifier of the participants. This group used intensity-based quantification. This group used spectral counting. It was all allowed. This was some kind of hybrid approach. Those didn't fill the form correctly. So the y-axis is the number of proteins which were reported in the study. And the color indicates in yellow people started from raw data and did the whole thing themselves. And brown is people who used the provide peak intensities and only focused on statistics. And so you see already that the number of proteins reported from the same data file, so we're not talking about different work, like data acquisition workflows, we talk purely about data analysis, the number of reported proteins varied dramatically, right? Well, those guys misunderstood the instructions, so that happens too. So this used exactly the number of proteins that we provided as uh, organizers. And so you see that already there, there is quite a bit of difference. But that was really not the point of the study. We were more interested in the quantitative um, aspects. And so this was a more interesting part for us. So here we have, again, the x-axis is the identifier of the participants. And now the y-axis is the number of reported differentially abundant proteins. So we, were asked, we asked them to report differences between every pair of mixtures, right? So 4.2 4 comparisons. And Below the horizontal line are the true positives. So there was a maximum of 36 true positive changes. And so the bars below the line are the number of true positives reported by the participants. Above the horizontal line are the false positives. And you see already that there is quite a bit of difference between some submissions and some other submissions that some people reported a lot of false positives, including those, I don't know if you, you probably cannot see here, there is 2,002 uh, false positive differential abundant proteins among the largest groups. So clearly there is a lot of differences in terms of how different labs went about finding uh, differential abundant proteins. And we knew which proteins were background proteins, which proteins were spike proteins, so we also asked the participants to report the estimates of fall changes on the log scale. And so here, the y-axis is the reported log fall changes among the background proteins only on the absolute scale. And so you see that the background proteins varied quite a bit. However, these participants could distinguish random variation from the systematic variation. And these participants clearly mistook some of this background variation for the true signal. So the point is that the right choice of statistic analysis matters. Now, another thing that we did was we asked the participants to fill in a questionnaire where they had to document different steps that they did as part of their analysis. So we had here input data, the type of things they used for identification of MSMS spectra, uh, quantification of MS1 spectra, summarized spectral features, statistical software, how they made conclusions, adjustments for multiple testing. And so Mina, who is sitting there and who will be presenting for the rest of the day, she did a lot of work putting together this figure. It was extremely difficult. And in fact, we realized, so we didn't want to be too pres prescriptive and ask for very specific details. And what we found was that some people just say something like, in-house scripts, you know, it can be pretty much anything, right? Or they say, just R, right? But sometimes they would be saying, we use, I don't know, Proton Discover, right? Or we use, I don't know, some other uh, Perseus, right? Uh, and the way they filled in the answers, we realized that they didn't quite know what the software was doing because they were putting essentially wrong answer in the wrong places. So we could see that sometimes there was not a full understanding of exactly uh, 
all the details of the steps. And the, so you really can't quite see the details here. The main point, really, of the slide is that there are many colors, meaning that there was a lot of choices that different groups uh, made uh, to find differential abundant proteins. And then, of course, they were interested in some tools did better than other tools. So, well, well, first of all, it was really difficult to find any similarities, some kind of groupings of this. So we could only partition the performance in the submissions based on the performance. So positive predictive value is the proportion of true changes among the reported changes. So these submissions have more than 70% of true positives among the submissions. This is between 20 and 70%, which is quite low. And this is below 20%, which is really low. And so, and then we were also interested in if there are some tools did better than other tools that was not conclusive. So, for example, these submissions all used Max Quant and Perseus. Some did very well, others didn't do so well. These used Skyline and modeling in R. Some used well, others not so well. Some submissions compared peak intensity versus spectral counts. These two found that both work well. This found that one works better than the other. So really a lot of differences. And so the main pattern that we found was the following. So this column um, indicates multiple submissions from the same lab. It was allowed. Any lab could do as many submissions as they wanted. And so here um, I circle multiple submissions from the same lab. And so what you see here is that just with one exception here, the labs never cross this line. So meaning that the labs who understand the methods, who know what they're doing, they can use multiple tools and they will do well. And the labs who need training, they can use multiple tools with kind of low success. And so this is another motivation, at least in my view, why we need to be here, right? And why we need to talk about different methods. And because there's a wide variety of things that can be done. There is more than one way to do things right. But there are also many ways to fail. And so we need to kind of try to understand what are the important concepts and how to distinguish things which can be appropriate from things which are not appropriate. And so this is really the main motivation of this uh, two and a half days. OK. So and by the way, the study is published, and the data set is publicly available, including for us, for this two and a half days. So we will be working with this data set, and we will be able to compare some of the results with the ground truth. So that was really the, um, the point of this introduction. So let me take just a uh, second to see if you have any questions. OK, so then I will stop reviewing what we did before. And now these are the new things. So what I would like to do next uh, is to share with you the work in our group, which essentially focuses on exactly the same question. So we want to know which proteins change in abundance. So this is the goal number two, right? So it's a supervised method comparing averages between the groups. And this is the a series of methods and software which our group developed um, for this purpose. So here's a motivating example. And this was a very old collaboration um, with the Ebersold lab many years ago. And uh, our collaborator uh, was studying two types of uh, cancer cell lines. So this was breast cancer cell line. So there was a <laughs> low and high invasive cell line. But their question was fairly detailed. So not only they wanted to know which proteins were changing in abundance between low and high invasive cell line, they also wanted to know how these changes were affected by oxygen exposure. Because in cancer cell lines, usually there's low oxygen um, kind of environment. And so they had normoxia, so regular oxygen, and hypoxia, low oxygen. So each of the cell lines has these two types of oxygen exposure. And the exposure was actually in different duration for 6 and 24 hours. So there were three things that varied. Cell line type, oxygen exposure, and duration of exposure. So in statistical terminology, this is called a factorial experiment, where you have three things vary, and we collect data and every combination of these different things that we vary. And in addition to this, um, they also had multiple replicate cell cultures. And within cell cultures, there was also multiple instances of sample preparation, and then also multiple mass spectrometry runs. And this would be one example from this one particular protein from this study. So here, x-axis is a combination of all the treatments 
each point is a spectral feature, and the color indicates a peptide for this protein. And this is, by the way, label-free shotgun uh, DDA uh, acquisition. And so the lines here would link the mean feature intensities across all the replicates of a particular peptide. So this protein has uh, three peptides. And the question is, OK, which, uh, in which conditions this protein is changing in abundance? So some things are obvious, right? So the first four are low-invasive cell line. The last four are uh, high-invasive cell line. So very clearly, this protein is differentially regulated um, between the two cell lines. But if now you want to ask more detailed questions, well, is the change between normoxia and hypoxia in MCF7 the same as change between normoxia and hypoxia in this cell line? Well, it's not so obvious because we see that the peptides, even though they kind of generally follow the same pattern, they don't quite agree. And here are the low dots. These are the missing values, which were just kind of denoted with some uh, low values. So some peptides are not entirely consistent. There's some variability here. And the goal of our work is to integrate all the information which pertains to this protein in this particular experiment and ask a variety of questions which may be of different complexity. This is another view of the same protein. So now you can look at the hypoxia versus normoxia for different exposure and different cell line. And so the collaborator that we worked with at that time was doing something like extracting the runs. Let's say, if you want to compare MCF7 normoxia 6 versus 24 hours, she would like literally extract mass spectrometry runs for this condition versus this condition and do some kind of pairwise uh, t-test. And as we discussed last week, that if we have more conditions and more replicates which pertain to the same problem, we may do better. We may do better in terms of understanding how much variation is in the biological system, we can do better in terms of distinguishing interferences and outliers and things like that. And so our goal was to essentially provide a more general and more flexible framework to answer this type of questions. So this was the original motivation. And so since then, the project grew quite a bit. So we started with shotgun, label-free, DDA, and then we expanded this to any type of chromatography-based quantification, in particular um, targeted uh, SRM quantification and data independent acquisition. So here we will not talk much about DIA, but the next two and a half days we'll focus entirely on uh, data independent acquisition. So I hope you will learn from that as well. So there are many things which are in common between these types of uh, data. So all of them use, well, areas under the chromatographic curve for quantification. All of them have multiple peptides per protein, which can all be subject to interferences, missing values, and things like that. So there's a lot of commonality between them. But there's also a lot of differences, in particular in terms of data quality. So for example, DDA will tend to have a lot of missing values and a lot of kind of features, primarily abundant features and low abundant features will kind of disappear. Selected reaction monitoring not only has multiple peptides, but also multiple transitions per peptide. And many experiments, in particular the ones we work with, they also have uh, labeled, heavy labeled reference peptides spiked in addition, uh, so corresponding to the targeted analyte. So that now we actually, like here, we have peak intensities corresponding to the labeled reference standards, which are spiked in a constant concentration. Here we have the endogenous uh, intensities, and so we see that the Labeled peptides are roughly constant, although here they start hitting the noise level. These are the endogenous, which are actually changing across conditions. So now not only we need to integrate the information across peptides and transitions, but also leverage the information from the labeled references and standards to improve the quality of quantification. And then data independent acquisition will have a much larger number of features usually, but they can also have more interferences, especially among the features which are very low intensity. And so we need to deal with all of these things. And so now, just to kind of give you a preview of what we would like to share with you is that it is a fairly large uh, framework at this point. So it still focuses primarily on relative quantification of proteins and peptides, what is changing. But there's a lot more to it at this point than, than just that. So we have tools for 
assay characterization, we have tools for quality control, we have um, tools for planning sample size, for uh, biomarker discovery, and so on. So we will kind of go through all of this um, as we can. What is important for us right now is that we really focus on a general framework to analyze complex experimental designs. So not only say, okay, I have healthy and disease, but I have experiments such as the previous one, which has many conditions, and how we can reflect the statistical properties of designs with these fairly complex experiments. So DDA, SRM, uh, DIA, and PRM is the main focus. So however, this time, actually, I think tomorrow we will, for the first time, try to present our pilot work with TMT to show how we can also work with the TMT labeling within the MSTATS framework. It's the first time we present it ever, so be patient with us, but I hope it will be useful, and we also hope to hear your feedback uh, on that. So, but for today, it is label-free or label-based, and it has multiple functionalities, so even though tools such as Skyline, OpenMS, and others, they in include a lot of data visualization tools, so we have some of them as well, emphasizing things which are important for statistical analysis. And of course, statistical modeling and inference and sample size calculation is a really big part of, you know, the thing that people need to know. So usually when we analyze a data set, uh, we immediately view it as a pilot study for something else. And so not only we will look for what is changing and so on, but we will also uh, work on extracting variance components and projecting the power or sample size or sensitivity of a future study which would use the same biological system and the same acquisition type so that if you want to follow up with that, you would have a sense of how much extra you would gain if you increase the sample size or lose if you have less sample size. And everything is free and open source. And we try to be as inclusive as we can. So we try to work with every uh, data processing tool that we can essentially access. So our input would be something that can be an Excel spreadsheet meaning that we need to work with tools which actually work with raw data, such as Skyline, uh, OpenMS, Progenesis, MaxQuant, Spectronaut, you know, many. We have Proteum Discover, and we have converters for many of the tools. We also have interfaces for tools such as Skyline. So with Skyline specifically, we have an external tool which uses graphical user interface, which integrates um, some of the functionalities that we have uh, with the Skyline infrastructure. And we also have a collaboration with Skyline for other tools such as longitudinal uh, quality control monitoring or assay characterization. So we kind of try to do both ways. Some of the methods are implemented in Skyline. However, the most methods are implemented within R. So other tools, they have just a subset of what we do. The most complete framework is within R and within uh, MS <laughs> And to answer a fairly frequent question of why R, and well, I hope by now you can have a sense that we like R quite a bit, right? So there are many good reasons from different perspectives. So from the researcher perspective, it is a lightweight environment. So we really, and researcher meaning uh, mass spectrometry researcher, right? So you don't need to work very hard to install the software. It is very interactive. You can explore the data, you can get quite far with a fairly little amount of, you know, coding skills. From the developers like us, it is really important because there's a large community of developers of statistical methods who rely on R, meaning that we can leverage the infrastructure and the methods which are developed by others. And we do this quite a bit. A lot of MS stats actually builds on packages by other developers. And on the other hand, it's also easy to extend because it's open source and it's all transparent. So if you work, for example, in an industry environment or in a core facility environment, you can essentially take this R scripts and embed them in a much bigger pipeline, in a bigger workflow. So you can also work with it that way. And from the science perspective and reproducible research perspective, we feel that working in R and in the command line environment is the best in terms of transparency. And documentation. So every single step has to be programmed, therefore it has to be documented. And the algorithms and the code are open, open to reproduction, open to criticism, and you can 
incorporate this again in a workflow which is fully documentable. So we feel that this is, well, again, there are many ways to do things, but this is a way which we think really covers a variety of uh, needs. So we think that this is quite interesting. So what we will do for this two and a half days, we'll actually use R to work through R scripts, which would allow us to use some of the MSTATS functionalities to analyze the IPRG data set. This will be, uh, at least for today, uh, the plan. Okay, any uh, questions so far? As long as they export data in a format that we can parse, that's all we need, right? So we don't necessarily need to know the algorithms they use to quantify peaks, identify peaks. As long as their export formats can be read by something, we can work with that. So for Proton Discover, we have converters um, to some extent, right? So um, yes. So it doesn't mean that we have to. So it's not like vendor mass, mass spectrometry vendor software that you need to have a, you know the access to to their API. So we work already in a R readable uh, framework. So sometimes it's not very obvious. For example, MaxQuant doesn't give us the output in a way which is just like you take this file and you read it in R. So we actually had to develop converters which extract the relevant information from various files in MaxQuant. But it can be done, and it was done. So, yeah. So sometimes it's just an export. Sometimes it's a converter. So depending on the tool. Yeah. But as far as we can, we work with the developers. So we work with the developers of many tools, including, for example, from Biognosis, Spectronaut. We work very closely with them. DI Empire, we work very closely with the developers as well. So we try to make it as streamlined as possible. OK, so now let's talk a little bit about what we're doing. I'm way behind the schedule, but we'll get as far as we can, and we will continue tomorrow. It's all right. So as we've heard last week, uh, experimental design is really key, right? And generally, more than just experimental design, understanding the scientific question of the study and translating the scientific question into a statistical question is really important. And it's important, at the very least, to know if we even need MSTATS. You know, does our scientific problem even, is MSTATS is a good solution? Maybe we actually need clustering instead, or maybe we need, you know, classification methods. So the very first question is to know whether our problem is actually a class comparison problem and also whether the experimental design was done in a way that eliminates biases, because maybe we don't even need to analyze this data because, you know, all the healthy were acquired in one year, all the disease were acquired in another year, and, you know, no amount of MS stats or anything will help you with that. So that's important. So um, just kind of considering that we really need to look at the differences is one thing. Selecting conditions, selecting replicates, uh, focusing on randomization and sample preparation and data acquisition, all of that. So we talked about this extensively last week. So these are very important concepts uh, for us. So this was one example of a complex experimental design that MS stats can handle well. Here's another example just kind of to illustrate a little bit the complexity that MS stats can handle. So this was another collaboration that we had quite a few years ago. This was a work with um, Osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma is a childhood uh, bone cancer. And these were <clears throat> clinicians who were interested in not only kind of understanding the disease, but also looking into the effects of the treatment. So they had 29 age-matched healthy controls for which they collected plasma samples just at one time point. But then they also had 14 uh, individuals with the disease and not only they had the blood or plasma samples at diagnosis, but they also followed them at multiple time points during chemotherapy. Then they had surgery. They had, again, chemotherapy after surgery. And then, well, I don't have it here, but actually some time after that, they also had follow-up samples in time uh, quite a bit later on. And so their questions were such that as, which protein changes in abundance between healthy and disease at diagnosis? Which proteins change in abundance in the course of the treatment? Which ones change primarily during chemotherapy? Which one change primarily after surgery? Which proteins at the end of the treatment gain levels similar 
to the controls after the treatment. So you can see again there are quite a few fairly complicated questions that you can answer, ask and answer. The biggest difference from this experiment is that here each cell culture at each condition was independent from each other. In this case, we have one person profiled across multiple time points. And so clearly the variability within a person is less than the variability between people. So this is actually a combination of a time course and group comparison design. And this requires different models than if you just have independent replicates. MSTATS recognizes that, and we will fit the right models in the background. So from the user perspective, what we need is that we have a convention that each biological replicate has to have a unique identifier. So if you have a person, so the person has to have a unique ID. And we essentially look for patterns in the data. And so if the same person is ID appears in multiple conditions, then we know that this is a repeated measurement, so time course or pair design. If different conditions have completely distinct individuals, then we know that this is a group comparison design. And in the background, we will figure out what's the right model for this design, and we will uh, fit the right model. And so this, by the way, sometimes is the source of mistakes or bugs, you know, or error messages where people say, oh, I have some kind of strange error message. Well, maybe because there was a typo in the identifier of a subject, and so it was intended to be the time course design, and suddenly you have a completely new identifier, which is only present in one group, and then MSTAT starts thinking, okay, you have a very complicated design, when in fact it was just a typo in the subject identifier. So these are the things which usually kind of um, require some care. But as far as the model itself, we do as careful work as we can to fit the right model. So this is the idea. And so now the next step, which is very important, is data processing. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't do this ourselves because there are people out there who do it much better than we do. So we don't reinvent the wheel. We work with them. So we have all of these different tools. And you will find on the website documentation on how to work with uh, uh, different tools. And after that, once we read it, so I think I have an example here. Yes, so we have something which we call a 10-column format or something kind of similar to that, where essentially we would read in data which can be stored in an Excel spreadsheet. Each row of the um, file will be a chromatographic peak. So here, for example, we have multiple peaks which come from the same protein. They have some peaks come from this peptide, and next peaks come from this peptide. Uh, for MS1 peaks, we have the charge. If this is a SRM or DIA, we also have fragments. So we will have the fragments. Um, so for example, here we have the label time, heavy and light. So for SRM experiments, we have heavy and light. If there's no labeling, everything is light, right? And then this is what I just mentioned, very important the identifier of biological replicate, call it one, two, three, call it ABC, doesn't matter as long as it's a unique identifier uh, here. And this is the intensity on the original scale. And one of the first things we will do here, we will take the log of the intensity because we will be working on the log scale. But so, and this, just to kind of answer your question, so as long as your favorite tool, even if you have a custom tool in your own lab or your own custom company, if it can export data in something that looks like that, we can work with that in principle. So this is uh, so this is the idea, right? And so what we will do, we'll do some data visualization QC, and then normalization will be one of the most challenging steps. And after that, we will be working with missing and outlying peaks, quantifying protein in the run, and after that, we kind of go to the statistical analysis. So this is the plan, <laughs> and so let's talk about that. Any questions so far? Right, so, so that actually doesn't look at the intensities, so it looks at samples. So what you will need to do, you, so on one hand, you will kind of export the data from your experiments, let's say from Skyline, right, or from OpenMS. So you will have something that looks like a tabular report, right? But this is not all because some of these tools don't necessarily take into account who is healthy, who is diseased, right? 
So you also need to provide a separate set of information saying these runs come from condition one, these runs come from condition two. These are biological replicas, these are technical replicas. Because most spectrometry doesn't know, right? It just works with biological materials. So you need to add this information on top. Some data processing tools incorporate this as part of the infrastructure, others don't. So what you would need to do is to essentially create this type of annotations. And sometimes you do it automatically, sometimes by hand, depends on how you do it. And this is what we will parse. So this is not quite yet the proteins, right? It's really the samples. And so if you say this is a biological replicate A, B, and C, this is, and then you say condition one, and then you go again and say A, B, and C, and you will have condition two. Then we know that the same people were in two conditions. So conditions probably time, right? Or maybe it is something like, you know, tissue biopsy, like tumor versus healthy, right? So it can, you can also have not necessarily time points, right? On the other hand, if it's A, B, and C condition one, and then D, E, F condition two, then we know that two conditions have completely different biological replicates. And that informs the kind of the modeling behind them. Then I'm asked that can, can guess which is the best output. That's right. So, uh, it's not like uh, there's a finite number of different models. Not like it's an, they're not. Amstrad does not invent models from scratch, right? So essentially, it's an if-else statement, right? If it's a group comparison, fit this model. If it's else, right? If it's a time course, fit this model. So uh, the number of models are finite and they're all well documented. So it's not like you will end up with some surprise, <laughs> right? But the model will be adapted uh, to the design which you have at hand. Including, you know, like this one, which has a combination of group comparison and a time course. And it will do the right thing in the background. And maybe let me acknowledge right away, Mina, who is sitting there, she is the person behind a lot of this work. And it is really, without her, I wouldn't be standing here. So, <laughs> so okay. So that's, um, that's the plan, right? And so once, and let me also tell you that in terms of the, error messages and all of that. So uh, this is really where most error messages happen, right? Because we expect, so for example, uh, we expect one peak uh, per run, and MSTAT will also make sure that you have the same number of peaks across runs. So if, for example, you have, let's say, the same peptide, the same charge, right, and everything in the same condition and the same run twice, it can happen, for example, if a chromatographic peak eluding twice, right, and the tool somehow picked up two peptides which have the same ID within the same run. So this is a problem because then we don't know what's the experimental design doing. So when you have technical replicates, when you have biological replicates. So this will be something that during the hands-on you will look at. But kind of for the moment, let's just kind of say that what is required is the one row is a peak, and we, so we just want to make sure that we don't have these duplicate rows in this, uh, in this uh, data structure. Okay, so the probably most important step, and by most important, I mean the most time consuming, right? And one which affects the conclusions quite a bit is the normalization. So this is one way how MS stats would visualize the data. So here the x axis is mass spectrometry runs. The vertical line separate conditions. So this particular experiment had 10 time points. So we have three replicate mass spectrometry runs within each time point. And the y-axis here is the summary of all the log intensities across all proteins, all peptides, all fragments, everything which was acquired in that particular run. So these are box plots. So the box contains 50% of the data, right? The line in the middle is the median. And so we see now that the overall signal across all the quantified analytes here essentially went up as the uh, time progressed. Now, this experiment was randomized. We just arranged now the runs in a way that kind of uh, it follows the time. And so the question is, is this change an artifact of data collection or is it the actual biology? And just looking at these box plots, the fact is that it's really hard to tell. And so we need to build into our experiment additional infrastructure to be able to distinguish artifacts from data acquisition or something else that could have happened here and the actual biology. 
So in this particular experiment, actually, it was a targeted SRM acquisition, which had labeled reference peptides spiked for every endogenous target of interest. And so now, if we consider that, MS Stats actually visualizes this as a kind of two-side plot. So here we have all the mass spectrometry runs, and we show the summaries of all the reference peptides spiked across the entire experiment, and these are all the endogenous uh, peptides. And so we see now that the reference peptides, they were supposed to be in as constant concentration as possible, right? Because they have no biology in them. They're reference standards. They're all spiked in constant concentration. And those boxes, they are a lot more stable than these boxes, right? So already this tells us that probably some of this change is biology. However, the boxes are not identical. So either mass spectrometry had some of the variability, and hopefully that's the case, or it was not spiked in exactly constant concentration. So assuming that it was the mass spectrometry signals, what we can do, we can equalize the boxes of the standards and then apply the same transformations to the corresponding endogenous intensities of the mass spectrometry runs. And so we can equalize these boxes in different ways. We can only equalize the medians. We can equalize the boxes entirely. And MS stats actually um, does all of that. And so now we see that after normalization, there is a clear shift in the signal. And now for the background of this, this was a targeted experiment um, with yeast. And the targeted analytes were selected because they were expected to change. So clearly, a lot of this would have been biology. But because there's so much change, without the standards, it was really difficult to know if it's a biology or technology. So um, just to kind of go over a few types of normalizations which are available in MS stat. So one is based on the standards. And so, and here by standard, I mean a single standard. So not every experiment will have exactly the same number of standards as peptides of interest. So if you do, for example, uh, label-free LCMS or DIA, you may have one or a small number of standards, global standards, spiked um, through the experiments. And so the way this normalization would work is that we would subtract the median of the log intensities of the standard from each feature in the run, and then add back the median of the medians just to make sure that we did not change the scale of the intensities. And so there are good things and bad things about this. The good things is that the standard does not have biological variation. So every variation we see is the artifact, so we can correct for this with the standards. It doesn't depend on if we have a targeted experiment where everything changes or a global DIA experiment where a few things changes. We can still use this. The problems are that it only counts for deviations that occur after we add the standard. So for example, if some biases were created as part of sample storage, adding standards later will not really correct for that, right? And the standards, the same can be noisy. We can spike them accidentally in concentrations that are not equal. They can be overlapped with some endogenous peaks. So sometimes by normalizing with respect to some noisy standards, we can actually do worse than not normalizing at all. So in our experience, a very kind of a reasonable practice would be to use multiple standards, try to find them in a way that they overlap as little as possible with the endogenous peaks in the mixture, but not use all of them for normalization, but use a subset and use the remaining standards essentially as a validation. So if the, the standards which were not used for normalization improve the stability across the runs, it means that normalization was helpful. If by normalizing the second set of standards, we actually, the standards became more noisy, it's an indication that actually uh, our normalization introduced more noise than, uh, than helped. Ideal, an ideal standard would be some kind of biological standard where a protein is controlled so tightly that it doesn't vary at all. In our practice, we have not seen such a thing. It's, it's really hard to claim that this, no matter what you do to your sample, what kind of stress and so on, that the protein never changes in abundance. It's just uh, very rare. So we just work with several sets of standards. It is also good to have standards which control for different things, a standard for digestion and then a standard for uh, data acquisition and so on. But it's always good to have one standard which was not touched so that we can see how normalization affected that standard, where we know that there is not supposed to be any change due to the biology. So this is one. 
And then another type of normalization which comes from genomics and which is often used is the normalization based on the medians of the endogenous peaks. And this is something which was developed for gene expression microarrays and kind of stayed from that. So we assume that even though we have many analytes in our study, the majority of the analytes will not change between conditions. And therefore, the medians, the median signals across the entire experiment should remain stable. And so this, and so this type of normalization is used for label-free experiments such as DDA or DIA, and we would equalize the median intensities of all the endogenous signals between the runs. So this is a reasonable assumption, except if you have an experiment such as a targeted experiment where the majority of the analytes are changing, then the medians will not be identical. So equalizing the medians is very dangerous. And this is one example. This was actually a spike in mixture where we just titrated some of the peptides across concentrations. And if we didn't know that, and we assume that the median signal should be equal, well, you know, you remove the signal together with the normalization. So this is quite uh, dangerous, right? So the advantages are that this is more stable than a single standard because it's based on many uh, peaks, and it counts for all data processing steps. The disadvantage is that it can only work with experiments where only a few things are changing and the majority of intensities are not changing. And so the best practice for those is, let's say, in discovery DIA or DDA experiments. So this can be done. And then uh, another kind of extreme, and this is what we can do, for example, if we have a large number of standards, is uh, use quantile normalization, which equalizes not just the medians of the signals, but the full boxes completely. This normalization tends to be quite aggressive, and it can really normalize away some of the true biological signal. But if you have many standards which have many peaks, and you know that all of them are not supposed to have a biological signal, this may be quite useful normalization. In our experience, when we work with real data sets, I would say that this is the part which takes a lot of time. And I would probably argue that one of the reasons that in this ABRF study we had such a big diversity of results was probably due to diversity of normalization. So the only way to check is using those standards that you left out, that you never... So you pretend that they are biological proteins, right, which were part of your sample, but in reality you know that they are constant. And so you do different normalization steps, and then you see the effect of the normalization on these uh, proteins. And so this... So if it didn't introduce extra noise, so that gives you extra confidence that your normalization steps were not compromised by, you know, noise and so on. So if you have just one standard and you normalize with that standard, how do you check? Then you trust. So you, <laughs> so you need multiple standards. And this is why experimental design is so crucial, right? And this is why what I was saying, you design the experiment best when you know how you will be analyzing the resulting data. And so if you know that you would need normalization, especially in long-running experiments, right, where clearly you would need that, you will be much better off thinking it through and introducing additional standards up front, right? And of course, I think too many, it's difficult, they may be expensive, they may increase sample, increase sample complexity, right? But one or two is usually feasible, right? And so this is something, something that you can think up front. Well, your second best would be some proteins which you can expect not have much biological variation, but those are difficult. And multiple standards per stage of that is useful because what can happen is that digestion can affect different runs in different ways than mass spectrometry, right? And so you cannot really ha have a single adjustment to everything the same way, right? And so that can be uh, quite useful as well. Yeah. And by the way, so this is another thing. So uh, the reason why we use mul potentially multiple standards, let's say, for SRM experiments is because when you equalize the medians, it means that you say, okay, there's a shift in the signal between the runs. So you assume that the shift is constant, meaning that whatever happens to the run, it affects every single protein the same way. And so this is a really big assumption, right? And so, by the way, maybe it's a good time to talk about this. 
when we talk about batch effects, right, and data acquired at different time points, so people say, can't we just normalize this away? You know, we can just have a normalization. These normalizations make super strong assumptions, such as every protein is affected the same way by the same amount across batches. It usually doesn't happen. And so then our results are affected, uh, reflect our assumptions a lot more than they reflect the actual biology. So designing the experiment to minimize batch effects, such as using techniques such as blocking, right? Incorporating standards at different type, steps of the procedure to minimize the assumptions is a really good practice. But again, it's really hard to think about this type of design if you don't have the analysis in mind, right? And this is why we kind of need to go through the whole step. <coughs> Oh boy. <laughs> well, so the first suggestion would be to design an experiment to avoid that, right? If it's not possible because of the biology, then my second suggestion would be to understand your biological system better before going into a large scale experiment. And try to have some pilot studies where you experiment with different types of standards, trying to understand exactly how things are changing, right? And essentially develop maybe do some simulations generating data which would look like like fake data just on computer uh, which would look like your studies and you know for this particular kind of studies you, you, would, you would need to see what works best in this particular uh, context right but because the fact is that if your samples are very different so they can be different for two reasons they can be different for the biological reasons but they can be also different for the technological reasons and you would need to find a workflow which can take it apart, because otherwise you will pick up on the signals which have nothing to do with your biology, and you can go on on those you know, potential candidates and targets for too long, and then it falls apart. So you kind of want to find those artifacts as soon as possible. So in our kind of case, if we have types of data that we're not used to, and we don't think that the assumptions we usually make for normalization would work, we would actually generate fake data on the computer, simulate quite a bit, and try different methods and see how different assumptions affect uh, the results. So I, I would certainly do that work if it's, if it's a case where it's really difficult to separate that. And uh, yeah, we do this a lot, especially for new types of experiments and new types of data. Yeah. Okay, so this is normalization. Okay. So, but I think these are, these are really important, um, important discussions. So, next step, well, I will just finish whenever we need to finish, and we will, we will find a way to, to wrap it up. So, and then the statistical analysis, right? So, those of you who were here last week, you remember that we would need to have some kind of statistical models, right, which describe the variability in the data after normalization. And we will use these models. So in last week, we talked about just assuming independent replicates and normal distributions and things like that. We would need to build some kind of quantities from the data, such as signal-to-noise ratios, right, which will allow us to say this signal is larger than the random variation due to noise, right? And we had some criteria uh, to decide how large is large. And this can be characterized in terms of p-values. And so then, we would do ex essentially exactly the same type of thing, except that our models will have to be more complex, somewhat to reflect more complex designs. But at the end of the day, we will use these models to build the signal-to-noise ratios. So we'll describe the variability, we'll describe the signals. We'll use them to derive p-values in a similar way as we did um, last week. And the result would look like this, where the x-axis will be the fold change on the log scale. We call it practical significance because fold changes are informative often, and the y-axis will be uh, p-value adjusted to control for false discovery rate on the negative log scale such that high values mean statistically significant, low values mean not statistically significant. And so then MSTATS would report um, 
this in the form of a volcano plot. So the horizontal cutoff corresponds to the false discovery rate among differentially abundant proteins. Vertical lines are what we call practical cutoff if you want to only focus on fold changes above certain threshold that you choose. But as long as the statistical significance cutoff is respected, we can add additional filters on practical significance. So this will be one type of output. Another type of output which can be useful, for example, if we have time course or any kind of experiments with multiple conditions, we may want to kind of see how things vary in time. And so for experiments with more than one comparison, we also produce this type of output. So the x-axis here will be pairwise comparison. For example, time 2 minus time 0, time 3 minus time 0, time 4 minus time 0, and so on. The y-axis are proteins, and the color is essentially the significance. So blue means significantly down, red means significantly up, black means not significant. And so you can kind of see how the proteins evolve across multiple conditions. So these are the two outputs. So I'm just giving you the upshot, and then I have a whole bunch of slides which tell you how we actually do this. So I will start on that, and then we will see, I will find um, a way to uh, continue on that. So let me just give you the kind of the first important step, which is quite useful for what we do, especially from the perspective that we try to work with different data processing tools. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, the really important part of the interpretation of this data is to deal with things such as interferences, outliers, missing values, and put all of this fairly heterogeneous information that relates to the same protein um, together to make conclusions for the protein. Now, since we take as input data from different data processing tools, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of how different data processing tools make decisions. What they call missing value, what they call interferences, what they call outliers, and so on. And so this slide is an, actually an illustration on that. So we have two data sets here. One is a label-free LCMS data set from uh, uh, the Jurgen Cox paper on label-free quantification. So this was a controlled mixture with some titrations of multiple components. And this is another data set from um, Spectronaut, which also uh, has a control mixture. So this data set was processed with three tools, Skyline, MaxQuant, and Progenesis. And this data set was processed with two tools, Spectronaut and Skyline. So let's take a look here. So each histogram is the distribution of log intensities of all features reported for this data set by the tool. So across all proteins, all peptides, all fragments, all runs. So the gray area reports the signal intensities uh, across the tools. Now, this is the same data set. And so you see already that the three tools report the intensities on a fairly different scale, right? So for example, progenesis tends to have smaller values than max quant and skyline. And this is understandable, right? So for example, if you quantify the peak by the height of apex versus you integrate the area under the chromatographic peak versus you truncate the tails and you only report the area everywhere except the truncated tails, it will give you different numeric values, right? It's pretty clear. It doesn't really matter because we're not interested in the intensities of individual values. We want to compare them between the runs. So as long as they're comparable, it should be still fine. So this is exactly what I mean by making decisions which may be meaningful and different, but they should not really matter qualitatively, right? Now, in terms of the number of peaks, you can see that Skyline, I hope you can read there, uh, Skyline reports 203,000 peaks. Uh, MaxQuant reports 224,000. And Progenesis reports 56,000. So there is a big difference in the number of peaks. But there is more than that, because um, if you look at these lines here, this is also the frequency of values which are very close to zero, like either numeric zeros or things which essentially round up between zero and one. And Skyline reports 1,300 of those zeros. MaxQuant reports no such values. So clearly MaxQuant has some kind of truncation at low values. And progenesis reports 600 zeros. On the other hand, 
MaxQuant reports 38,000 missing values. Progenesis has no missing values. And Skyline has 33 missing values. So you see that for the same data set, the type of data reported by different tools varies quite a bit. And the same thing for DIA. So here, uh, Skyline reports 3 million peaks, um, and Spectronote reports 2,800,000. Um, Skyline has 661,000 zeros. Um, Spectronote only 38,000 zeros. Skyline has 2,000 missing values. Uh, Spectronote only 13 missing values, right? So quite a bit of range of values between them. And so essentially what it means, and we have been working with this for a while before we realized that we should not take these values literally. Because essentially what happens is that different developers and different tools make use of different devices to report problems with data quantification. So essentially when the peak is standalone, well-resolved, and nice, you know, the values will be very similar. The main difference happens when the peaks overlap, or they are out, like in SRM, if they're outside of the scheduled window, right? Or if the peaks are close to the limit of detection or limit of quantification. This is where dif different tools really differ. And they make different decisions because they were developed in different contexts for different instruments, potentially, right, with different purpose. So it's not a problem, but for us, we need to read between the lines and try to interpret exactly the intention for these tools. So, for example, Skyline tries to distinguish peaks which are below the limit of detection and peaks which cannot be quantified reliably. So, for example, if a peak is there but it's heavily overlapped with another peak to the point that you cannot get the integration, they will report an A. But if the peak is very small and below the limit of detection, they will report a very small value of zero. So also, in other situations when they cannot integrate the peak when you schedule a transition incorrectly, and the peak is, the, most of the peak is outside of the scheduled window, so you see the peak is kind of there, but you can't quite integrate this, they'll report NA. So essentially it means that zeros and NAs for Skyline, they distinguish missing at random versus missing due to li low limit, the abundance being below limit of detection. So Skyline, in our experience so far, it's been the only tool that actually distinguishes that. The majority of other tools, they will either use NA or they will use zeros to report all the unavailable peaks. And because they don't distinguish this, we kind of assume, because it's the most frequent, the most likely possibility, that when the peak is either zero or missing or has very low value, it is because the analyte is below the limit of detection or below the limit of quantification. And therefore, what we decided to do in MS Stats is to essentially have a cutoff. And this cutoff show, is shown here by the vertical, dashed vertical line. And we said that no matter what these values are, call them 0, NA, low values, and so on, essentially we will not trust these values. We will say that these values are small enough that they are not very accurate. And this vertical cutoff is determined in a completely ad hoc manner. So we essentially find the median of this gray histogram. Then we find the 97th quantile of the right values, because we think that the right tail of the distribution is more accurate and more stable than the low tail. Then we look at the difference, the distance from the median to this quantile, and we flip it. And we have the symmetric value, because we assume that these distributions are roughly symmetric. And this becomes our cutoff. So essentially, this is the cutoff which, which is determined separately for each experiment. Um, but we say that below this vertical line, we will not trust these values. Now, if we don't trust them, this doesn't mean that we don't use them. So we say we know that this analyte is most likely to be below the limit of detection. So maybe it's completely absent, maybe it's very low abundance. We will have to treat it as such. So just claiming it as a completely missing value will be wrong. Because missing means we don't know. Here we know it's missing because it's low. So in Skyline, it's actually the case. In other tools, we assume that this is the case. And the downstream statistical analysis will have to account. So in statistical language, it's called censoring, where something is not observable below a certain threshold. And so the next steps of statistical analysis will account for the fact that we may have outliers due to interference. And we also have censoring due to limits of the instruments to see the analytes below a certain threshold. 
And so this is what this would look like. So this would be the kind of our representation of the data structure in these experiments. So this will be one particular protein. The protein will be acquired across multiple runs. And the pink annotations of this data structure explain the fact that we have multiple runs. We may have technical replicate runs from the same biological replicate, so the same subject. We have multiple biological replicates which come from the same condition. And then the same for the next condition, we have different subjects, same or different subjects, multi potentially multiple technical replicates, and so on. So this is the pink part of this data structure reflects the biology of our experimental design. Now, the yellow part of the data structure reflects the technology. So this protein, for example, can have multiple features. So if we have, let's say, a DIA experiment, we have for a protein, let's say we have three peptides, and we have three transitions per three fragments per peptide, it means that we have nine features. So this data structure will have nine features. Y here, this will be the observed values of log intensity. NA will be missing values, and some of them will be missing at random in the case of Skyline. Otherwise, they will be missing because they're censored due to low abundance. And so our goal on the statistical side would be to summarize this data structure and look for differences between conditions in the way which accounts both for missing values and accounts for outliers. And this is why I'm running out of time, but I will make sure we'll come back to this. I'll just need to talk to uh, the rest of the instructors to see if we finish this today or tomorrow, depending on how it fits best with hands-on. But so this is the plan for the rest of what I haven't finished yet. I will tell you exactly how we get, essentially, to those volcano plots and to those heat maps with p-values. But for the moment, let's take a break. OK, so I was allowed to finish my part right now. So let's do that. And so as soon as I'm done, then we will start with the uh, hands-on uh, part. So let's just keep going um, as we were. So the point where we finished just before the break was that we take as input essentially data in tabular format, which would be the which will be the output of different tools, and different tools make decisions, well, for good reasons, so they have their own reasons for that, but they're not the same decisions for everybody. And so, therefore, we try to essentially understand the intention between the values as opposed to take them literally. And we came up with this vertical cutoff, which essentially says that below this cutoff, we don't trust the values. And with the exception of Skyline, which explicitly distinguishes missing values because they cannot integrate the peaks versus missing by low abundance. For every other tool, we will assume that every missing peak or very low value is censored. So that, because it's the most likely explanation of that in this type of technologies. Okay, and so now this will be our kind of mental scheme, right? So an abstraction that we use to represent the data from these experiments. In this table, this is one particular protein. So each column is a run. And the runs have groupings. So first, they have groupings in terms of technical replication. If it's present, if it's absent, no problem, right? But if it's present, we will have multiple technical replicate runs per subject. And then we have biological replication. And the subjects are grouped in conditions. And in group comparison designs, we will have different subjects in one condition and different subjects in another condition. If the ex experiment contains a time course, then we will have the same subjects in condition one and the same subjects in condition two. And so this is how MSTAS will recognize that there is a time course aspect to this design. And, uh, and so usually I, we're kind of trying to use this color scheme to use pink to represent the biology and yellow to represent the technology. And so now the yellow part of this data structure, this is really the technological, the mass spectrometry related aspect. So this protein has multiple features, just as I said earlier, feature is essentially a peak in the spectrum, right? So if you have three peptides <laughs> and three fragments per peptide, you have nine features, right? So we don't really distinguish uh, peptides and um, transitions. By the way, if for some experiments, it's meaningful to do peptide level quantification. For example, because you're particularly interested in uh, post-translational modifications or something like that. So we can essentially trick 
MSTADs and instead of protein names, give peptide names. So let me just show you here. So here we have protein name, right? And these are different peptides. So just add another character, another symbol or something, so that MSTAT thinks that this is one protein and this is another protein. And then we can do peptide level quantification. So as we mentioned last week, doing peptide level quantification, it is nice because peptides may not agree with each other for quantification for good reasons, such as PTM. It is bad because suddenly our space of analytes increases dramatically, right? It, it creates, increases multiple testing and so on. So only do it if it's absolutely necessary, right? But in MSTATS we can do it. So in this case, this will be multiple features of a peptide. But for our purposes today, let's talk about protein quantification, where we're interested in integrating all the information across uh, peptides and uh, fragments to make protein level conclusions. Okay, so if you remember from last week, we talked about the fact that we, the two group comparisons, we can extend them with more complicated models, which essentially describe every source of variation which can affect the intensity of a peak. So this is what is uh, happening here as well. So this is kind of more advanced that we have time to speak about here, but let me just give you kind of the very high level overview. So why is just like last week, it is the log intensity of a feature, right? It's in number in this table. And so now we will say, let's say this is the overall mean of this whole data structure. And so now this intensity of the feature in a run, well, it is affected by the condition from which this feature came, right? So if it came from healthy, it may be maybe systematically larger than it came from disease. At the same time, it's affected by the subject that belongs to this condition because, well, some people have naturally more of this protein than others. So we also say that this intensity is affected by the subject. It is also affected by the mass spectrometry run because some runs may have more or less intensity from that, right? And then also we have features because some features ionize better than others, so some features have higher intensity than others. And then we have the remaining essentially unexplained variation. So this particular model will be for the group comparison design when we have different subjects in each condition. And so this is how kind of classically uh, statisticians would look at this, right? So they would say, okay, well, there are different sources, essentially rows and columns, which affect the intensity, log intensity of the feature. And I'm kind of trying to stay with the same color scheme. So pink is the biology, yellow is the technology, and run is the link between the two because it represents both biology and the technology. So there's an, another aspect to this, which is also very important for statistical analysis, is the fact that, remember, we talked about randomization, right, last week, and the fact that it's really important to randomly assign everything. Well, in this particular experiment, we do not have a complete randomization. And the reason being that when we have run one, we acquire all the features within this run at the same time. And then we have some other run, let's say we randomize, we go to this run, we acquire all the features for this protein in this run at the same time. It doesn't work like we acquire this feature, then some other feature, then we come back to the same run. It doesn't work like that, right? So run is a restriction on randomization just by the way the technology is set up. So therefore, run is a block. And so if we incorporate this information in the way we analyze this data, we can show that in a very special case when we have no missing values and every runs and features have exactly the same number of replicates, Conclusions regarding conditions, so this is what we're interested in, right? We want to compare conditions from this type of model, which represents this data structure, are identical to the conclusions of a procedure where we first take the average of feature log intensities within the run, and then we work as if we had one number per protein per run. And I know there's statisticians in the audience, so for those I'm saying this particular type of analysis is called a split plot design. And so for the split plot design, the conclusion between conditions is based on the summaries of runs and not on the individual features. This is in a very special case when we have no missing values, no censoring, you know, and so on. This is not our case. However, we use this as an inspiration and we said that this is the model which we want to used to describe all the sources of variation, but what we will do, we will replace it with a two-step procedure where first we will summarize all the features in one number per protein per run, and then we will fit the right model across conditions. 
And so this is what MSTATS is doing. So, uh, and this will allow us to actually treat censoring outliers, missing values in a very general way. And so this, to us, it was really a qualitative shift in the way we think about these problems because um, many people thought about censoring and so on uh, in LCMS workflows, but in my view, this is the approach which allows us to very generally accommodate a very broad variety of experimental designs in a way where the users do not have to worry about this too much. So let me kind of elaborate on this a little bit. So let's, for the moment, ignore the biology. Let's just focus on the technology. So now we have these data structures where we have runs, right, and features. And so now you see that I put NA censoring underneath, right? So those will be all features which were below this vertical dashed line. So these are all the features we don't trust, and we assume that they're missing because the analyte was below the limit of detection. So the only exception is Skyline. When Skyline has NA, we leave them as NA. Also, later on I will talk about labeling, if we have labeled, referenced, or any type of standard. If we, have a, we, if we happen to have a missing value with the standard, we will leave it as a missing, because it's unlikely that the standard was below the limit of detection. But other than that, every missing value will assume that this is due to low abundance. And so the very first thing uh, we will do is to work with censoring. And in statistical literature, there is actually a... <coughs> some things disappear here. Well, so in statistical literature, there's a lot of work on how to accommodate missing values which are informative missing, when they're not just randomly missing, but they're missing at low abundance. So let me just kind of give you... Uh, the intuition. So let's say I have two groups. So let's say we have healthy and disease. And so let's say for disease, the, these are the individual subjects, right? And this is the log abundance, right? So let's say for disease, the protein is abundant, right? And then for uh, healthy, we just missed some low abundant values because of censoring, right? So let's say this is our detection. So if I assume that these values are randomly missing, I would be comparing this mean to this mean. But if I assume that there were more values which are missing, I would say, okay, I don't know exactly what these values are, but I know they're small. Therefore, I will not be working with this mean, I will be working with something which will be lower. And it will allow me to get a more accurate estimation of difference between temperatures on the whole scale. So essentially, this is what these methods do. They do not just say, I don't know what these values are. They say, I know they're missing, but they're small. And therefore, it affects the estimation of the summary in this group because it will be driven towards small. So this is what is called informative missing values. And this is if we just have two conditions. So well, it turns out that we can do exactly the same thing with this two-way table. So on one hand, we have features. On the other hand, we have runs. And so essentially, our requirement is that the feature is present in at least run, and the run has at least one feature for this protein. And then we can essentially infer what would be the values of the missing values uh, for that. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that you don't know. I mean, so, well, you, you know how many missing you have, right? Because you, they, they are missing. We determine this, this kind of cutoff uh, just based on the you know, lowest value of the picker test, which could be quantified. What you do not do, you do not just adjust this somehow manually, right? Well, what you're actually saying, and this is something which is kind of outside of what we can talk about here, you change the way you estimate the mean. What you do, you use an approach called maximum likelihood to estimate the mean. And for data that you observe, you use your data. For data that you do not observe, you say it's a range of value below a cutoff, and you weigh this essentially according to the probability distribution. If you assume that there's a normal distribution somewhere, you will say some probability associated with this range. So in principle, you don't even need to estimate kind of this individual missing values, you can just get the mean here and get the mean here based on the maximum likelihood. And this would work, except that maximum likelihood is not very resistant to outliers. 
And we have both problems. We have missing values and outliers. And so our initial idea was, let's just do maximum likelihood and immediately just infer these two means and compare them. What we found was that when we have outliers, let's say them here, so then the maximum likelihood will not do very well. And so what we decided to do instead is to have a two-step approach where we use this censoring approach to impute, essentially predict the plausible values of missing values. And then we will use a second step of summarization using 2 key median polish, which is a robust summarization, which also counts for outliers. And the result is that we have one number per protein per one. So um, again, since I know that there are some statisticians here, there's actually a way to do a single robust estimation with censoring. We found that numerically it was not very stable. And so we decided to kind of, for numeric stability reasons, we decided to do this um, uh, two-step procedure. So for no statisticians in the audience, essentially what that means is that we have a summary of this log intensities in a run, which accounts for the fact that some values are small. We don't know what they are, but they're small. And also accounts for the outliers using a robust summarization procedure. So I have here a description of what Tukey Median Polish is doing, but it's essentially a two-way summary where we have a summary of all the features using median instead of means. So you can kind of look at this uh, later on. So this is what's going on. And so now that we have one number per protein per run, so then it becomes a much simpler problem because now we only need to worry about the biology and things such as group comparison, repeated measurements, technical replicates, no technical replicates, and so on. And this is a much simpler problem because we already produced all the summarization. And for this type of models, there is a lot of infrastructure in our this type of models existed for a long time. And we can now fit the model which matches the design. Any questions? The problem is that if you just calculate the median, those are missing values. No, we assign them to zero. You can do that, but depending on the pattern of missing values and outliers, it can affect things. And so let me actually maybe move straight to the evaluation. I will show you a little bit the difference. Mm -hmm. So we give this meaning value after you normalize? Right. So normalize and actually everything. Everything is done after normalization. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Normalization comes first because, you know, otherwise your, your signals are really affected by, by the outliers. So let me show you the evaluation and maybe this will... Oh, and actually just if we have label reference standards, we can extend these models to this as well. Let me show you the evaluation. So maybe this will be a little bit more kind of obvious. So this is our IPRG data set that you will look into just after. And the good thing, as I mentioned earlier, right, the good thing is that we have some sense of the actual truth, right, in this data, because it's a controlled mixture, so we can now see how different methods go about finding differences between the groups and how the estimate fault changes. So this is one protein. This is a background protein. So just to give you a sense of what's going on, the light gray lines here, these are the individual peptides of the protein, right? So we have 12 runs, four conditions, three replicate runs per condition. So the, the, in the background, those gray lines, these are the peptides of this background protein. Now, the um, color lines, the green line here, this is probably one of the methods that is most frequently used, including by tools such as Skyline, where you take, let me go back here, when you take the sum of feature intensities on the original scale. And this is a very common thing to do, right? When you just take, take the sum of all the peak intensities, and then you have one number per protein per run, and maybe then you take a log. So this is the green line summarization. And clearly, right, the individual peaks have these values. The sum is above the individual values, right? So the green line is above the gray lines. So that's clear, right? Now, the 
yellow triangle, these are linear models. So this is essentially not doing anything what we discussed, but just fits this linear model to this data structure. So not worrying about censoring, not worrying about to commit and polish. Now the yellow line with rectangle, it's only robust summarization, exactly what you just said, right? So let's not worry about the imputation of missing values, let's just go for robust summarization and nothing else. And then this brown reddish line, this is essentially the, I should have called it MS stats. So this is what MS stats is implementing. So we can just take a look at that. So, okay, first of all here, this is a protein which has no problem, right? So it has no missing values, no outliers, by the way, this blue line, this is the line below which we don't trust the values. So here, everything is very nice, right? And so when everything is good, everything is good. Pretty much every method gives you compared condition two to condition one, true fault changes one, estimated fault changes. Here we trust like this on the original scale, so we undo the log at the end. Adjusted p-value is almost one. I mean, every, every method and every tool gives us the same answer, so there is really no problem. Now, here's a situation where we have outliers among low intensity or interferences among low intensity peptides. So as you can see, log of sum is not really affected by this very much, right? Because um, it is, um, well, a little bit, but because the sum happens on the original scale, if you have interference in small peaks, it wouldn't make a big difference, right? So here again, we compare, let's say, condition three to condition one, true fall changes one, right? So Log of sum is little affected. Robust method and MS stats are not very affected. The worst effect is on linear model, right? Because linear model will be sensitive to outliers, right? If you don't do anything, it will really be undermined by this. So essentially, the means and the group will be kind of down. But here's a situation where we have uh, interference in a high intensity peak. And log of sum will be the most affected. So if you take the sum of peaks on the original scale, and the highest peak is affected, well, the sum is affected, right? And so you see here, comparing condition 4 to 1, uh, log of sum gives fall change of 3.5, when in reality it's 1, right? Because this single peak was uh, misquantified. And then robust methods do better, and linear model kind of does a little bit better with that as well. Okay, and the real life is more like that, right? Especially among the abundant uh, proteins, where you have a little bit of everything. You have uh, outliers and low intensity peaks, you have uh, essentially censored values, you have outliers among high intensity peaks. And so this is to kind of follow up on your question. So the difference between the first two lines is robust summarization only versus robust summarization and censoring. And then it depends on exactly the pattern of where censoring occurs, you know, where outliers occur. So I agree that just robust summarization is the second best in this case. But we have done a lot of empirical evaluation, and it does seem to contribute to that. So that's kind of how it works. Now, the biggest advantage of these methods, in my view, is reproducible research. So remember, we started the last hour by saying that we are doing this not because we want to practice fancy methods, but because we want to make sure that our conclusions are as little dependent on the individual choices that the tool make, right? but reflect the underlying biology, right, and under, underlying content of the samples as much as possible. And so this really allowed us to evaluate that. So in addition to the IPRG uh, experiment, we actually accumulated a whole collection of controlled mixtures where we have some sense of ground truth. So it's either some kind of spike in mixtures or titration mixtures like in this experiment. And so this, these are three data sets which are all acquired in uh, shotgun DDA mode. So this is the IPRG, which we just discussed. This is the LFQ from Jorgen Cox. This is another spike in mixture um, that we had. So each data set was uh, processed with three or even four tools. So this is Max Quant, Skyline, and Progenesis, and here we also had a uh, protein discovered. So this column corresponds to quantification by taking the sum of peak intensities and then taking the log. So here we only focus on proteins which actually change between conditions, and we look at the intersection of how many proteins were found differentially abundant when processed by each of the three tools. And here we do the same thing, but with MS. That's, and we see that the agreement between the tools 
for all the data sets improved because now we can interpret the missing values and the outliers in a more general way. And the same thing for DIA. So this is another example for DIA. So this is log of sum, Skyline versus Petronode, and here the agreement improved, and here is Skyline versus Open SWAS, the agreement also improved. And to me, this is the biggest value of that. It's not because we want to be fancy, right? But because we can expect with higher probability that the conclusions will not depend on the individual tools, but they will depend on the underlying composition of the samples. OK, <laughs> and just to finish of what we do with MSTAT, so as I mentioned in the beginning, that we also uh, work on sample size calculation. And as we have seen quite a bit last week, we need to know a lot of things about our experiment to plan future studies, including the extent of biological and technical variation. And so what we do when we analyze the data set, we immediately get variance components. By the way, I hope I was kind of clear that we do this per uh, protein, right? So we'll essentially do this over and over and over, one protein at a time. And so to plan the experiment, we would need to have variance components, but we can do something like, let's take the median values of protein, of variances across proteins, or maybe 75th quantile to be on the conservative side. And then we produce power curves like that, which also control for multiple testing. And what we said last time was that if we have a targeted experiment where most proteins are expected to change in abundance, we typically need a smaller sample size than the global ex discovery experiment where only a few proteins change. And the reason for this is that when we plan these experiments, we control for false positives, right, or for false discoveries. And if the future experiment, everything will be changing, there are few opportunities for false discoveries, so it's easier, right? But in an experiment, we have many, many proteins, but only a few are changing. There is more opportunity for false positives, so we need to work harder to protect ourselves against false positives. And in this context, it means having a larger sample size. We discussed this quite a bit last week. It's on YouTube if you want to review this. I'm also happy to answer questions if you were not with us uh, last week here. Very last word. So we have um, MSTAT, so it's essentially open source, R-based software, which has a lot of documentation, and it doesn't show on the projector very well, but we have a website you can take a look. And it's available in multiple places, including through Skyline external tools. So I was looking at this yesterday, so we had 12,000 downloads unique downloads through Skyline. We are roughly at 300 downloads, unique downloads per month through Bioconductor. So there is a really substantial user base for that. So these tools are stable and we try to provide support within our limits. You know, we cannot really analyze every single data set, but when there are like bug reports or error messages, we try to look into that as much as possible. So we do try to provide um, support for that. So probably now it's a really good time to turn uh, this to Mina, who will introduce more of the hands-on part. And I think for the rest of the day today, it's the hands-on exercises with MS Stats. So I will stop here, but I'm here all day, somewhere on the floor. So go find me if you have more questions. And just to, since while well, Mina is setting up, uh, we're usually starting at 9 but we're all here at 8. So 8 to 9 is just the extra hour for more questions going over some of the things from the previous day. If you have your own data or questions, how your experiment fits into this framework, please ask. <laughs>